The Illawarra region has long been regarded as one of the strongest rugby league nurseries in the world, producing more than 20 internationals over the years, including greats like Bob Fulton, Graham Langlands and Michael Cronin. There were two unsuccessful bids for a Wollongong-based team to join the Sydney competition in 1954 and again in 1966. But it wasn't until the late 1970s that the powers that be agreed to a strong submission from the Illawarra. The league uh, decided at that time, uh, the management committee, to recommend to the general committee that we do include uh, two additional teams, which at the time, of course, uh, were Illawarra and Canberra. Illawarra's submission was based largely on the continuing drain of so many good players to Sydney clubs and the effect that was having on the local competition. Illawarra have produced some fantastic footballers uh, over the years for Australia and uh, some of the greatest players uh, to ever play uh, for the country have come from that area. Our platform was that we weren't joining the New South Wales Rugby League Premiership in effect, that we were bringing world-class rugby league here to Wollongong on a regular basis. Our star players had joined Sydney clubs, our media were concentrating on the New South Wales Premiership and of course our supporters were travelling up the road with the expressway uh, not having long been opened. They could get up there and now the most Sydney ground. So we thought it was a necessity and uh, I'm sure or after 10 years looking back that uh, I'm sure that everybody now agrees that was the right move. Did the, the league chiefs take a lot of convincing that Illawarra warranted a, a spot there? Not only the league chiefs but uh, a lot of people within our own district. A lot of people, you know, they had very much doubt about whether it was the right move. Alan Fitzgibbon from the Dapto Club was named as Illawarra's first coach. Then came the tough job of building a team which would be competitive in the Sydney Big League. Bob and myself probably canvassed every every door that was available to us because we, we realised that we had to we had to go on an attack probably from the outset uh, in an endeavour to try an, an approach. And a lot of the, the people we were after basically said no for the simple reason they didn't think the place would ever be competitive and it was going to be too tough a job for them. But John Dorohy, a former Illawarra Western Suburbs junior who'd made a name for himself with Sydney Club's Western Suburbs and Manly Warringah was lured back to the Illawarra with an offer of the club captaincy. The step being that I was coming down here to uh, captain the first Illawarra team uh, certainly gave, made me proud to, to be a part of that. How tough was it to entice players to a club like Illawarra, very much a fledgling club? Well, it was difficult for the simple reason we had nothing to sell. We had nothing to offer apart from probably a new venture and a new opportunity. And uh, you probably got to take your hat off to those uh, senior personnel that we were lucky enough to, to get in those early days that uh, they formed the foundation uh, of what's, uh, what's here at the moment. With a few short weeks to the start of the Steelers' Sydney Premiership campaign, the side was beginning to take shape. Following John Dorohy down Bulli Pass were other former Illawarra stars who'd carved out successful careers in Sydney, including Rod Henniker and Brian Hetherington. It was very hard travelling up the expressway four, sometimes five nights a week. Um, and I'd like to come back and play for the local area, and so um, it all worked out well in the long run. In the gym, trainer Ken Boothroyd used disco music to lick the Steelers into shape. After countless hours of sweating it out, the Steelers were ready for almost anything the big Sydney clubs could throw at them. Although Alan Fitzgibbon had some doubts about the mental toughness of his less experienced players. The physical side of thing was never ever going to be a problem because physically all the players could probably aim up or get close to aiming up, but they just weren't prepared or aware of the, of the mental toughness that had to be uh, applicable on a week-to-week -week basis in, in this competition is probably that's something that doesn't happen overnight and in those early days that was definitely a problem we knew it was going to be there and we just had to handle it the best way we could because we didn't have probably the, the overall artillery that all these other Winfield Cup sides had. The Steelers went into their debut season without a major sponsor but three weeks into the Premiership the Steelers scored that historic first win a game where a young hooker Michael Bolt was making his first grade debut. It was against South Sydney and uh, we beat them I think 20 to 10 down at Wollongong Showground, a very muddy wet day and uh, we certainly partied all night long that night. <laughs>
For skipper John Dorohy, two games stand out in that first season. The big two was the first win against Souths in the wet here. Uh, it was great to win our first one and it was like winning a grand final for everyone. Uh, the next one was a win over Manly uh, by the drop goal, 26-25, uh, if I remember correctly. Uh, it was great to beat you know, one of the top dogs. And it was Dorohy's field goal that clinched the victory against a team chock full of internationals. Fullback John Sparks flashed over for a hat trick of tries. It was also at the Wollongong showground in 1982 that the Rugby League world was stunned when giant West prop Bob Cooper put two Steelers in hospital and copped a record 15-month suspension from the league judiciary. Bob just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. He turned around and the fight was on and, and he saw someone coming at him so he let go and uh, he smashed uh, poor Ali Pomfret's nose up um, and then he turned around again and someone else had walked into another one of his and then someone else again and yeah, it was just one of those things where every turn he had to throw a punch to, to save himself. Illawarra's debut in the midweek comp, then the KB Cup, wasn't exactly memorable, losing 47-20 to Manly. In fact, it would be four seasons before the Steelers would break through for a win in the rich midweek knockout. The club's biggest win in 82, 45-nil against Canberra. The following week, a 51-nil loss to Newtown. Both remain club records. Illawarra finished its first season with six wins and 13th spot on the Premiership ladder. Wayne Springall won the inaugural Stegbar medal as best and fairest. John Dorohy, who was named in the Kangaroo Train-On squad at the end of the year, topped the point scoring, while Shane McKellar and John Sparks shared the try scoring honours. The side that we had was pretty young, mixed in with uh, a lot of experience, and, and Fitz himself was, uh, was a young coach then too, and uh, uh, we had a lot of enthusiasm in the side that year, and uh, everyone was strived to do really well. Through to Pomfret, Hetherington. He's stepped inside Vorton. He's high stepping towards the line. Graham Foe might score. Yes, that's a try. Players that were at the club at the time and the amount of money that was in the club at the time. I think uh, achieving six wins in your first um, season in the toughest competition in the world um, says a lot for the uh, for the coach and the players at that in '82. Alan Fitzgibbon still at the helm and Kiwi forward Mark Broadhurst joining the players backing up for a second season. The Steelers was a much more confident outfit going into the 1983 year. And the results started to come. Kaiser Stuhl became the first major sponsor and the Steelers recorded successive wins against St George, Newtown and Penrith to earn the club its first television game at the Wollongong Showground. Their opponents, Manly Warringah. Creevy also being busy. Creevy, Creevy still going, looking for support, dancing around, unloads. Goes on the bolt, bolt back to Thompson. Can the Steelers get in? Still trying around, there's Henry, can he go to the corner? And the Steelers are into the crowd's corner. Manly won 26-18, but the Steelers were far from disgraced. The club was playing an attractive style of football and had uncovered an exciting wing three-quarter in Shane McKellar. In a brilliant season, he crossed for 18 tries, a record which would stand for the next eight years. Unselfishly, he puts his success in 1983 down to his teammates. Brian Hetherington, he played for New South Wales and uh, John Dory, he played for Australia, so you couldn't have, me playing on the wing, I couldn't have wished for two better players inside me. League commentators still rate McKellar one of the best finishers in the modern era of the game. He was an electrifying player, he was in a tainer. I can still see him running from one side of the ground to the other, not, not going forward, but no one trying to, they couldn't trap him. And then eventually he would go forward. Uh, he, was, he was a personality player. Another key player in 1983 was hooker Michael Bolt. He won the Stegbar medal, helping the Steelers to eight wins and 12th position on the ladder, one spot higher than in 1982. The club was starting to form on the We could see we were getting combinations together. Everything was coming together uh, very well. John Dorohy had another big season in 1983, again taking the club's overall point-scoring title. 
but after two years with the Steelers, coach Alan Fitzgibbon decided it was time to leave the club and with mixed feelings. There was a lot of lows in that time, but uh, I feel after two years, I, I felt it was possibly time for, to stand aside due to the fact that I, I thought I'd needed a break at that stage, and that's, uh, that was the only reason. It wasn't with sadness. Uh, I felt I'd done my bit initially to start it off, and it's, uh, I look back with, with pleasure and pride to see the way that the place is uh, succeeding at the moment. When Alan left at the end of 83, he, uh, he left a, a very good established club for, uh, for Brian Smith to take over in 84. And the base was there, Alan, that, Alan's job was to come in, formulate a base, and he did, and he did a great job at it. And uh, from there we, sort of, we started to work from that. With an impressive nine wins in 1983, the Steelers in just two seasons were already being talked about as potential semi-finalists. <laughs> Nineteen eighty four remains one of the best years in the Steelers history. Brian Smith, a relative unknown, took over as the coach of a team which would soon become the talk of the Sydney competition. It was a tremendous opportunity for me. I was only twenty nine at the time, so I think I was the youngest ever uh, Winfield Cup coach. That was a great honour and a super challenge. Former Australian and St George Lock Rod Reddy was the major new signing and his contribution was enormous. He was just sensational in 84, not so much for his, his on-field deeds or performances but by just the, the experience that he was able to, uh, to pass on and the, the, the little things that matter so much to, to young, particularly young rugby league players. Illawarra strung some amazing wins together in 84 with players like Wayne McPherson and Greg Mackey emerging as the club's bright new stars. But it's gone out of the week three quarter, Moon. David Moon and there's Mackey. Mackey will score. A great try to the Illawarra Steelers. As the season went on, Illawarra was well and truly in the hunt for a semi-final spot. Fantastic year. I just one of great excitement for everybody who was involved with the club. Uh, you know, we had some a, a tremendous mixture of, of uh, really great young, and I mean really young. We had a heap of 17 and 18 year old guys who, uh, who came through in 84, plus we had the, the experience of, of Rod Reddy. Brian Hetherington was also devastating and earned himself a place in the New South Wales team as the Steelers ripped apart the competition's best sides in front of a growing legion of red and white fans. The um, supporters were uh, getting behind us, our gates were uh, increasing with spectators and all that uh, you know, sort of bound together and it, it made a really good year. So good in fact that the Steelers were within one win of a semi-final berth going into the last game of the season at Brookvale. The Seagulls ran away with the game 34-10 for Illawarra, it was so near yet so far. Really devastating that, to, to lose that game because we, we really went there with, with some form of confidence. But you know, I think realistically when we look back on it now, it was a tremendous achievement by everybody involved in the club. The club was you know, way over its head in debt and everybody virtually, including the coach, did it more or less for almost for nothing. We, we didn't get a lot of money out of it, but we really enjoyed the success that we had in that season. The Steelers finished the season in 8th position with 12 wins and 12 losses. The club's reserve grade side won the minor premiership and the President's Cup team won the grand final. Wayne McPherson was the leading point scorer while Greg Mackey topped the try count. Hetherington and Bolt were both selected for representative honours in what was a memorable season for the club. The players sort of stuck together and they were a team and uh, friendships were developed in that year. And I'd say out of all the seasons we had played with the Steelers, 84 would have been the, uh, the year that I'd probably remember most. It was a great year to be a part of it. The winds were coming thick and fast and we just had a great side together and uh, that was a lot of fun. After the success of 1984, the Steelers were hoping for a bigger year in 85. But it didn't turn out that way. While the side showed glimpses of the form that almost took it to the semis, it was a year the club would quickly want to forget. Finishing with the wooden spoon and midway through the year, nine losses in a row in a horror stretch. 
Coach Brian Smith says some of the players the club was relying on simply failed to produce the goods. He said, well, all these young players will get better in 85 because they've done so well this year. It just didn't work out that way. A lot of them just, you know, we had, we had a couple of guys who had, you know, health problems. We had a couple of guys who just didn't come up. They had social problems. We had experienced players like Dorothy and Reddy who didn't play well and, and didn't play a lot because, you know, through injury again. We got the taste of the highs and the lows pretty quick. 84, if we'd have won the last game, we'd have got a playoff with South in Canberra for a top five position next year at the bottom of the table. So we, we quickly learnt what uh, pro football was all about. One of the few high points in 1985 was a first ever win in the midweek Panasonic Cup competition against East. But Brian Hetherington says it was a season that couldn't end quickly enough. Players don't play well when things and when everything's not going right in the club. And that year, things weren't going right in the club. We were losing games, and uh, everybody was trying to find out reasons why we're losing games because we had a good year the year before. Uh, and then we sort of have a bit of trouble between players and coaches. And all, all that together uh, ended up a bad year. John Dorohy left the Steelers at the end of the 85 season after four memorable years with the club and in his farewell season he was still showing plenty of his old magic. John Dorohy is probably the most talented player we've had and that's a, that's a big statement uh, with some of the players we've got in the other space at the moment. But John Dorohy had enormous talents anywhere in the back line, he was a great competitor and he won the club several tight games. He used to just spring out these games that uh, when he wanted to, Joe could just turn a game and that's what he was like, he was that sort of footballer. If he was uh, switched on for the day, well, we could win. The man they call Joe Cool puts the secret to his success down to a very laid-back approach to the game. Oh, I guess it's probably more casual attitude toward the game. Um, you know, I, I don't know, it, it always takes the 13 guys on the park to achieve something and uh, I'd have to say that, you know, with the help of the other guys, it took the pressure off me to be able to come and go in and out of the game as, as I wanted to and uh, that allowed the, you know, the little um, tidbits to, to occur. Dorohy deserved a better finish to his stint with the Steelers than a wooden spoon and just five wins. Joe Cool was leading point scorer, while Greg Mackey topped the try tally. Michael Patterson won the Stegbar medal and Brian Hetherington was the club's only representative player. Nineteen eighty six started disastrously for the Steelers. The club's big off season signing, former international Steve Rogers, broke his leg in England before the year had even begun. That was exactly the start to the season the Steelers didn't want. We really needed a lot of things to go right for us. When they went wrong it became made it even more difficult, but more challenging as well, more character developing as well, I guess. And there was plenty of time for character building as the side continued its poor run. While star flanker Alan McIndoe continued his try-scoring spree, match-winning leads were thrown out the window and confidence dropped to an all-time low, something seized upon frequently by opposing teams. They knew they were in for a tough time against us, uh, but they also knew that if they hung in there long enough, they'd probably beat us as well. And we probably had that philosophy that, oh, we're coming down that final 10 minutes, we're leading. You know, and it's very hard to, you know, you're on tender hooks, and then when you're on tender hooks, you tend to make mistakes when you're not playing with the, the sort of the confidence you should be. And uh, that, I think, came through with our play quite a bit. In another disappointing season, the Steelers were again languishing on the bottom of the Premiership ladder with just seven wins for the year. Alan McIndoe's 11 tries made him the leading point scorer. Brian Hetherington and McIndoe were the club's representative players for season 1986. During its early years, the Steelers' problems weren't confined to the playing field. Financially, the club had all sorts of problems, and the economic recession of the early 80s almost brought about the total collapse of the club. The plan was to be supported financially by all of the district lease clubs, and we went into 82, of course. In 1983, the recession hit the district. One club closed, and a couple of others were very close to it. Some still haven't recovered from that 83 recession. We'd gone out and virtually spent the money in advance, to, to to formulate the, the club and the playing strength and uh, so we had to uh, we had to battle through that there were times back in the early days when it was it was close to going broke mid 80s yes i'll confirm that 
The years from 1982 to 1986 were a nightmare for the Illawarra region, with mass job losses in steel and coal, and an economy in tatters. Some say the steel has helped pull the region out of economic ruin. Slowly the people of the district came to accept that it was great when we did have that victory every now and again. To Monday morning was big smiles on their faces, you know. And whilst there was doom and gloom in, in some of the workforce, there was, there was a bit of joy and, and happiness when the Steelers, you know, had a victory. 1986 marked a turning point financially for the Steelers, with BHP taking over as the club's new major sponsor. For the first time, the club had financial security. It's a good thing. It's a steel. It's still a steel city, I guess, and uh, the Steelers go well with uh, with the team. Um, it's now a recognised name right round Australia. Support from our own employees here is up around 90 per cent. It's just a great, great relationship. Do you notice any change in personnel here when uh, the side is buoyant and doing well? Boy, if we ever <laughs> if we ever win the comp, we might have to close down the next day. It's great. It's a great feeling. Probably the big thing that turned everything around was BHP's uh, involvement or their beginning with with the Illawarra Club, and I think from then on, the club's really had a very solid base you know, of true support in every possible way and probably the, the way that they really needed it, which was financially. And it's an arrangement that has backing from the very top. I must say that uh, since um, they've had BHP as a, as a sponsor, I think it's worked remarkably well for both of them. And in fact, I think it's one of the better sponsorships that we have in rugby league. 1985 and 86, the Steelers were determined to climb out of the cellar and the club's stocks were boosted with the signing of former Port Kembla forward Chris Walsh from St George. I was living back down here and uh, and plus I'd been at St George five years and I didn't like the way things were going then. I, I thought it was time for a change and you know I, I thought the logical thing to do was to, to uh, play here with Illawarra. The club made a great start to the year, winning a pre-season tournament at Campbelltown, then for the first time in its history, won its opening game against South Sydney at Redfern. An injury to Perry Haddock in that game gave exciting teenager Peter Phillips the chance to show his class. The 18-year-old 5'8 replaced Haddock and could be one of the finds of the season. The Steelers were one of the form teams early on in the 87 season and knocked over some of the competition's hottest sides. The Steelers drew a record crowd of just under 13,000 for its home game against Parramatta. Illawarra won that game 16-8. The club was given its first match of the round Sunday game against Manly and while the side played well Bradley's gone straight down the sideline and scored a try The Seagulls big guns were just too good on the day Cockrell gets it out to Shearer Shearer gets a big kick downfield now it's a chase on and there's uh, who's going to get to this It's Michael O'Connor Michael O'Connor gives it to Shearer Shearer will go in and score It's a great try to Manly Warringah Illawarra's early momentum in the competition was falling away. 87 saw the emergence of the Canberra Raiders as a force in the Sydney Premiership. The Steelers lost but took it right up to a side which would dominate the competition for the next four years. Park comes back on the infield. Super try coming up to Steve Larder. Oh, that's a magnificent reply. But as the year wore on, injuries to key players cost Illawarra dearly. Chris Walsh was advised to end his career after suffering a spinal injury. And at the end of Brian Smith's last season as coach, the club finished with eight wins and improved slightly to run 11th of 13 clubs. Michael Bolt was the Stegbar medal winner. Dean Carney narrowly missed beating John Dorohy's season point scoring record, amassing 162 points, while Alan McIndoe crossed for nine tries. Four Steelers were selected for representative duties in the 87 season, with McIndoe breaking through for State of Origin honours.
For Brian Smith, 1987 was the end of a four-year association with the Steelers. And he admits on and off the field, they were four tough years. I think everybody had the philosophy at the club or the, the ideal at the club that it was just a matter of trying to hang on, you know, to stay involved in it. And in, in those four years that I was there, I think, you know, we all, everybody did a pretty good job of that, of just hanging on by their toenails or their fingernails or anything you could grab hold of. It was, it was a really tough time for everybody involved. The Steelers scored a major coup for the 1988 season, signing former Parramatta, New South Wales and Australian coach Terry Fernley, with former Eels star Ron Hilditch as his assistant. I was looking forward to coaching the side, but it was, uh, it was a tough uh, performance, I thought, because uh, you can't be out of the game too long nowadays, you know, and I'd been out of the game coaching club side for four years. But certainly I was looking forward to it because they had heaps of potential a little while. And good news for the Steelers, prop Chris Walsh had fully recovered from a serious neck injury which sidelined him for most of the 87 season. And he was appointed club captain. Chris, I give him enormous raps, you know, he's a good captain. And uh, had great respect from everybody down there. The Steelers made a super start to the year, beating Canterbury, St George and Easts, with tries like this a regular feature of their play. Against Newcastle, Illawarra scored its first away win in 12 months. And after 10 matches, the Steelers had five wins and looked a chance to make the final five. One of the star performers was Ian Russell, who joined the Steelers from Mittagong and quickly cemented a first-grade spot. He just came out of the blue and he was a talented player. You could just see his tremendous and you know, he just got all these natural skills and uh, he'd come out of the ground and get them in his defence, you know, it's sensational, yeah. While the Steelers had a great start to the 88 season, the second round turned into a nightmare for Fernley and his men. The second half, we just fell in a heap, unfortunately. I don't know whether it was the, you know, the fear of having to win every week <laughs> might have got to us a bit. Whether it was concentration or, or what, I don't know. But, you know, we lost a lot of games by a few points and in, uh, you know, whether it was the last five minutes or ten minutes or so. so but at the end, they all carry uh, count as losses, don't they? Illawarra won only one of its last 12 matches in a disastrous run which saw the side concede 510 points for the season, or an average of 23 a game. I found it difficult to understand what went wrong, that we didn't continue on with our winning uh, winning streak. You know, it was just, uh, yeah, we'd lose games. We're in a situation of winning plenty of games, but uh, unfortunately, it's just that little edge that you have, isn't it? As I say, it's a confidence thing more than anything else, and uh, I found that difficult to turn that around. So unfortunate, I don't know, and I really, I still can't put my finger on why, because it was a very good start to the season Terry had, and I believe he had plenty to offer, and um, I don't know, I think, um, again, some of the personnel left a bit to be desired in their approach to the game. The players have their own theories on what went wrong. I think he tried to play us a pattern that we weren't used to, we weren't that, we weren't as good as players as Parramatta had at that stage. I mean, Parramatta had all stars and when Terry was coaching. And I, it, would, it was an easy way to coach sides, I suppose. They had the players there. But when he came to Illawarra, he found they didn't have the quality of player there. I don't think the players we had at the time there gave uh, Terry enough respect. I think, you know, a few of them tended to want to um, carry things their own way on the field rather than playing the coach's instructions, you know. And, uh, you know, I'd, whether the coach is right or wrong, I don't think you can do that. In a season that promised so much, Illawarra finished 13th on the ladder, Chris Walsh winning the Stegbar medal. Steve Larder was the leading point scorer, and for the third year running, Alan McIndoe was the leading try scorer. But it was a season in which he experienced plenty of highs and lows, being selected on the wing for Queensland while in Illawarra's second grade side. It wasn't a great year for me, uh, probably a little bit of uh, uh, not enough discipline on my behalf and uh, uh, I played a couple of games in reserve grade. It's a year I'd like to forget, although I, I represented uh, my country. It was McIndoe's performances for Queensland in the state of origin that earned him an Australian jersey, the Steelers first. Three other Illawarra players were called up for rep duties in 88 
which turned out to be Terry Fernley's one and only season with the club. Probably at the end of the year, Terry and the club would uh, both admit that maybe it was the wrong decision. It's probably one that uh, we do admit that uh, encouraging Terry out of retirement, uh, Terry did say to us at that stage that right at halfway of the season that he wouldn't be coaching the following year. And frankly, I thought that Ron Hildich would handle the job better than I would have done. And only because I've been out of the game for four, four years and it's a, it's a big break to have. And with Ron Hilditch in charge, the Steelers' side had an entirely new look about it. The team was entirely different from when I took over to when Terry, Terry had them the first year, insofar as we lost about 20 players. I'm talking senior players. And, um, and we introduced all these young fellas. Now, what they didn't lack ability. I mean, we could see the ability in the players, but what they lacked really was that day-in, day-out, tough grind of the Winfield Premiership. A key signing was a youngster from Jerringong called Rod Wishart, a protégé of Jerringong's favourite son, Mick Cronin. He coached uh, me for two years down there and um, he actually he, he advised me to stay down in Jerringong for a, for a couple of years and um, gain a little bit of experience down there and, uh, and then join Illawarra and uh, I did so and um, it's turning out a, a fairly good decision. Wishart played on the wing and took over the goal kicking duties with great success. The go up and Lee Canberra by two points to nil. Two other key members of the Steelers lineup in 89 were English internationals Andy Gregory and Steve Hampson. They added valuable experience to a very young team. But even with Gregory and Hampson calling the shots, the Steelers were in for a disastrous season, the worst in the history of the club. With just two wins in 22 Premiership matches, the wooden spoon was again headed for Wollongong for the third time in five seasons. I mean, it was a dismal season. I mean, you, you, there's just no other way to describe it. Chris Walsh won back-to-back -back Stegbar medals in 89. Rod Wishart was the top point scorer, while youngsters Brett Rodwell and Dean Schifoletti were the leading try scorers. Dean Calloway was the club's only rep player. But 1989 wasn't a total write-off. The Steelers had an incredible run of success in the midweek Panasonic Cup with some amazing performances in a complete reversal of their Winfield Cup form. The Steelers whitewashed Cronulla 40 to nil in its quarter-final. Brilliant! Magic pass to Rodwell. He might be a student at 18 years of age, but hasn't he handed out a lesson tonight? Norths were next in an exciting semi-final win. leaving a showdown with the star-studded Brisbane Broncos in the final at the Parramatta Stadium. The Steelers went into the game very much the underdog, but thousands of Illawarra fans travelled to the match on trains and buses. It was the club's first real taste of big match pressure. I think it's just a coming of age or, um, for most of the players, because we, we were a young side, um, and um, that was just a, start, a stepping stone of, um, I think, just a, for the Steelers itself. Wallers of dummy half, he's got the run around, he's linked up out wide, and further out wide is Tony Curry, and further on goes up, Jack Lloyd's in for the try. And early nerves saw Illawarra 16-0 down, and all but out of the game. Back out, he's in to score! Oh, what strength! But roared on by their fans, the Steelers made a remarkable comeback, and who could ever forget this magnificent Wishart try from a Jeff Hardy intercept. Hancock's chasing! Hancock's got him, he has it! Unbelievable, look at this! Wollongong has exploded! The Steelers went so close to taking the game, the Broncos finally running out 22-20 winners. But it was the young Illawarra team's fighting spirit, rather than the end result, which sticks in the memory. It really let people that don't belong to the area see how much courage these guys really have. And it, it showed that particular night that although everything seemed lost to such a high, uh, a, a much vaunted team as the Broncos, but it wasn't. Our blokes clawed their way back from, from the cellar and all but won the game. And uh, they won a lot of friends that night. It's probably the highlight of our 10 years with that Panasonic Cup final and uh, being down 16 nil and coming back to be beaten by two points and uh, the arrival of the team back in Wollongong in the early hours of the morning, the packed town hall. And I think that uh, we keep reminding the players of that. That awaits them when they win a Winfield Cup Premiership. And uh, it was just something that, that was probably one of the greatest parts of the club's history today.
Buoyed by their Panasonic Cup success in 89, the Steelers worked hard in the off-season for a fresh assault on the Winfield Cup. Did some good work in the gym and uh, our young players were you know, stronger and, and mentally uh, you know, we're, we're carrying on for 40 minutes each half, which was good. 1990 turned out to be a year with many highlights. On the field, the side quickly forgot the disappointments of the previous season, and the wins started to come. More than 15,200, a new ground record, watched Illawarra beat St George at the Wollongong Showground. The Steelers finished 1990 in a blaze of glory as one of the form teams in the Premiership. It was too late to secure a semi-final spot, but a fitting send-off for coach Ron Hilditch. In the slot and over for the try. It's good to be with the fellas. They were very positive, very go-ahead, and I think we won something like six out of our last seven, including including a draw with Canberra. Even though he didn't get the, the results, I think he... He did the, um, the groundwork and, and now we're starting to get the results now so he doesn't seem to get the credit but um, I think he did a lot of good work when he was there. Rod Wishart was one of the stars for the Steelers in 1990 and he gained selection in the New South Wales State of Origin side for the first time. Towards the end of the 1990 season, club stalwart Michael Bolt broke a long-standing record in New South Wales Rugby League by playing his 187th straight game for Illawarra. He capped his career by kicking a goal in the last first grade game of the year against Cronulla. There's someone who's going to play in straight now. Um, good luck to them. <laughs> They're foolish enough to try to do it. With that record under his belt, Bolt hung up his boots at the end of the 1990 season after 212 games for the Steelers, 153 in first grade. Michael Bolt's record probably won't be surpassed in, in rugby league. He's probably been our best club man. Uh, he, he gave his all on the rugby league field. In 1990, there was plenty to celebrate off the field too with the opening of the Steelers licensed club, just a grubber kick away from the Wollongong showground. They've existed in the last nine years without the financial backing of a licensed club. And let me assure you, that's an awesome task. A licensed club is extremely important to any football team, not just as a source of ongoing uh, revenue, but also you need to have that, that club, a place where members, supporters, players can get together. Probably the, the most significant day was the uh, combining of a, a three-way deal between the New South Wales Rugby League, Ken Arthur and John Quayle, with John Cleary and Jerry Ellis of BHP. Uh, John Cleary of Cleary Brothers and Jerry Ellis made a pact of the New South Wales Rugby League that they would assist the Steelers in the development of the licensed club, and I think that has cemented our future. The Steelers scored 11 wins in 1990 to finish ninth in the Winfield Cup competition. Rod Wishart and David Moon shared the point scoring honours, while Wishart and Rodwell were the club's two rep players. Successful season as Ron Hilditch's understudy, in 1991 Graham Murray became the Steelers' fifth first grade coach. Because I've always wanted to uh, coach a first grade side. When I played rugby league, I wanted to play first grade. And when I coached, I wanted to coach a first grade side. After their big finish to the 1990 season, the players approached the new year with more confidence than ever before. Pinchardelli once more has a go himself. Inside of Skipper Lydia, he crashes over for the try. We started off with the season like we played the Sevens, missing Sevens, and we made the Sevens here, and that was just the start. And then we went to the 10 or 10 challenge and we got to the semis here. But um, all the blokes believe that we can go you know, and make it two to five. And After two years at Penrith, Alan McIndoe returned to Illawarra. With Macca and Wishart on the wings, the Steelers had plenty of firepower out wide. Alan McIndoe, he, and he, he only have to have a little try on offer and he'll get it because he's got the pace and he's pretty strong. Rod Wishart, he's an inspiration to the side. He only has to get in there and sort of hang around the dummy half here in the opposition under a bit of pressure and our players, you know, appreciate the both the wingers. And those wingers combined for arguably the try of the 1991 season. <laughs> Youngsters like David Riolo, John Simon and Paul McGregor came into the first grade lineup, and for the first half of the year, the Steelers were rarely out of the top five. They're young blokes, but they've had probably three 
in some cases four years in first grade and uh, even though they're young they're, they're a bit more experienced these days and the young fellas coming in like the Simons and the Rialos uh, they get help from blokes who are not much older than them but uh, a lot older in the, in the head. At the Wollongong showground the Steelers lost just once in 1991 in the first round against Penrith. After that they were unbeatable at home. Here's another go. It's Riolo the fullback. One on one. Too much pace for O'Neill. That is a superb try. And the fans at the Wollongong showground, a record crowd rises one. We beat sides like Brisbane and Manly and, and Canberra at home, which you know they're very good sides. And the young players, you know, showed a lot of maturity. But it was a different story away from home where the side just couldn't fire. Straight through goes Peter Jackson. I think we get uh, spoilt by the people down here because it's such a good crowd and it's a good atmosphere, it's a great ground to play at. Yes, Newcastle had it when they first come in, but I think we've got it now that people don't like coming down here and playing. And as I say, I think we're just spoilt when we play at home. The women go away, we just haven't got that quite support and there's something we've got to overcome. It is dead set a mental thing and the, 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 the media's played it up that much here. I'm getting on the bandwagon now. But I think the boys are starting to wonder whether it's true or not. Despite their problems in 1991, the young Steelers proved they are definitely a side of the future. They were probably, when they were in full flight, one of the most entertaining teams in the competition. And, um, you know, it was great to see young guys like Rod Wishart, for example, make the Australian team this year and make such a success of it too. Wishart was selected after strong performances on the flank for New South Wales in the Origin series. He played two tests against New Zealand. Australia won both matches and Wishart scored in both tests. Right, here comes try number one for the second half for Rod Wishart. Playing in a, in a test side is, is a great um, honour for me and um, you know, I've really got to thank um, the other blokes in the side as well because you know, it's easy to perform individually when, you, when your side's going so well. And the Australian selectors say Wishart has the potential to become a permanent fixture in the green and gold. I think the lad is very dedicated and uh, he's very humble as a matter of fact and his attitude towards his football, his dedication towards his football is, uh, is something to look at and know quite well that the lad will go uh, a long way in rugby league and he will, st he will maintain that position on the wing. He's also got an ace up his sleeve which we haven't used in the Australian side, he's a very good kicker and I feel that Rod himself will be when Mal Meninga get, gets out of the game that if he keeps to his kicking he's going to be a permanent, uh, have a permanent place in the wing position for Australia. Wishart's wing partner Alan McIndoe also had a big year crossing for 19 tries the most of any player in the Sydney Premiership including five in one game against the Gold Coast. Alan's been a great player he's had to overcome uh, serious knee injuries to both his knees and um, he battles on now and uh, I hope that he's, he's with us uh, when we crack that premiership. Many believe an ankle injury which sideline skipper Chris Walsh was the difference between Illawarra making the semi-finals and missing out in 91. But the club still enjoyed its best season to date finishing eighth just one win out of the five. Rod Wishart took the point scoring honours and Illawarra had a host of representative players. Throughout the week, the Wollongong showground is a barren place. But come the weekend, all that changes as the Steelers draw huge crowds to the region's rugby league headquarters. Welcome to the Wollongong Showground, home of the Illawarra Steelers. We would like to thank you for your patronage and know you'll enjoy a fine game of rugby league. The crowds this year have been really fantastic. Um, yeah, really supporting the, the Steelers and uh, because they've been going so well and playing so well, I'd say that uh, attendance has been really good. We've had probably averaging 11 and a half, 12,000 people per game, which has been really good. Keeping you busy? Very busy, very busy. During the 1991 season, the Steelers averaged a record 12,300 spectators at home games. And the club has always drawn good crowds from day one in the Sydney League. The crowds have been great and, and I think now that's really what's lifting the club. The people have, have really accepted the fact that we're, we're part of the big boys and, uh, and I hope we, hopefully it won't be too long before they'll, they'll carry that big uh, Winfield trophy down the, down the past. 
But winning over the people of the Illawarra hasn't always been easy. It was understandable right from day one that people had links with Sydney clubs, such as the St George's and Balmain's, but uh, we're winning them over and I think our crowds are proving that now, that people are really enjoying their football and they're proud of their football team. And here's a die-hard Rabbitohs fan who finally made the big switch in the season just gone. A couple of years ago, I think we all had our followings, and you know myself, I was a South Sydney man all my life. Well, I'm a Steeler, and uh, they've converted me, and, and I uh, really cheer for the Steelers. And I know you can see shoppers, and, and, and when you come to work, if they won on Monday morning, it's great. The Steelers now have a loyal army of supporters of all ages. How long have you been supporting the Steelers? Um, about five years. Have you got a favourite player? Um, Richard. Why is that? I just reckon he's really good. Oh, it's a great side and it'll be better next year and uh, I agree with that policy of maintaining their juniors. I think that's the most important thing and I just hope they keep that up. They're going to win today? Yep. By kickoff time, the crowd has taken almost every vantage point ready to cheer on the home team. And for so many Steelers supporters, a day at the footy is now a regular part of their life. How long have you been following the Steelers? Oh, well, I've always kept an eye on their uh, on their performance, but uh, really got stuck into it this year. The kids have been fairly interested in the game, so I've been bringing them along. Playing well today? Yes, I think they're doing fine so far. It comes a bit of a family affair, does it, with all the, the kids and... Well, yeah, it's family. I've got cousins and nephews and all sorts of things along here now. It's about 13 or 14 seats along. <laughs> it's a good day out, isn't it? It's beautiful, yeah, really good. The three and a half to go, 34 nil the scoreline. Illawarra leaders. And the days when an afternoon at the league was the boys' day out is a thing of the past. How are they playing today, do you think? Unreal! They're killing it! Yeah, woo! And of course, every successful team has a cheer squad with one clear goal. We've got to um, put the, the atmosphere of support there um, to show the crowd that, you know, we are there for the Steelers and also it helps to get the crowd going as well. And with an impressive 10 wins in a row at home in 1991, it's been a memorable year for Steelers supporters.